Good morning. Welcome to Upstate Church Malden Campus. I'm so glad to be here with you guys this morning. Like Pastor Ashley said, my name is Sean Sorbin. I'm the student coordinator all the way over at our Anderson campus. And, you know, I, I just love this church so much. This church is truly so amazing. I've been going here for over seven years now. It's actually where I first decided to follow Jesus in our student ministry. And I've been a part of the student ministry, been, been as a, a high school, I've been a part of the student ministry as serving as an adult. I've been to all the different campuses, and man, this church is something special. Like God is doing something here, and, it, and like Ashley said, it's not anything we're doing, it's not anything we're saying, but God has just been so gracious to us. If, if you haven't made Upstate Church your home, man, make it your home today. It, it really is such an amazing place to be, and God really is moving uh, in this place today. I, I'm so honored to be here at our Malden campus. That's my first time speaking here, and I just heard so many great things about what God is doing here. Uh, Malden really is uh, such a good place. It's where I went to high school, and I just, I just love Malden a lot. It has a special place in, in my heart, and so I, I'm just really honored to be here and blessed, and I hope you guys feel that way too. But let's just get, let's just get right into the text. Let's just open up what God has for us in, in James. And so we'll be in the very last section of James, the uh, study, we'll, we'll finishing up this section, finishing up the series that we've been going through. And if you haven't been here, we have been in this series studying this book, analyzing this book on what, why James left us this letter. You see, James left us this letter as, as, a, as a book to Christians on how to live the Christian life, how you and I can practically follow Jesus better. James ends us off with what we like to call a mic drop here in this book. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to James chapter 5. We'll start in verse 7 and we'll read through the book. It says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath. Let your yes be your yes, and your no be your no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone among you cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, and pray for another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain for three years and six months, and it did not rain on earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruits. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back his sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Would you pray with me this morning? Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for you, so amazed at what you're doing here at Upstate Church Maldon. Lord, I'm just praying over the next few minutes that you would give me the words to say, that you would speak through me. Lord, that anything that I would say would come right from your heart and not from mine. And that we would be able to open up this text and see what you have for us this morning. Lord, we love you so much. In your name we pray. Amen. Let me set the scene for you guys. The year is 2020. This is the year of COVID when everything was so bad. The world shut down. There was sickness all over. It's the year of uh, earthquakes and wildfires and natural disasters. It's the year of political division, the year of boredom. There was so much to do, so much that we just had to do, and we just didn't know what to do. This year was just awful. Uh, A lot of us, you and I in the room, know that this year was not great. We like to just check it off the calendar, and it just wasn't a good year. You see, except for one thing, though. You see, the year 2020 was the year the brand new Xbox Series X and PlayStation 5 came out. And as a young boy growing up playing video games with my dad and my friends, I knew whatever it would take, I would have to get this new Xbox Series X. And so Andrew and I, one of my best friends in high school, we decided that we would do anything to get this new 
Xbox. And so the, the, the Xbox came out a couple weeks before Thanksgiving, the year of 2020, and, and a couple things to know about this system. You see, you had to either be really lucky, you had to be uh, pretty popular in the world, pretty famous, or you had to do something not so smart to get this new Xbox. And Andrew and I decided that we would go the route of doing something not so smart. And so here was the plan. We would leave Thanksgiving early. And now if I had to leave a meal early, just know that it had to be important. But I'd, we'd leave early and we heard that the GameStop on Woodruff Road had some for Black Friday. And so this is what we did. We, we went to GameStop and our plan was to spend the night there, be the first ones in line so that we would get the new Xbox Series X and brag to all our friends about it. And so that's exactly what we did. We left Thanksgiving early. We get there. There's already five people in line and we're worried, but they all wanted Playstations. And so we were the only two to want Xbox Series Xs. So we were the first in line to get the brand new Xbox. It, it was an interesting night. There was a lot of random stuff. First of all, if you don't know this, nighttime cold is actually way different from daytime cold. Like it is freezing at night. We needed blankets and, 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 and sweatpants and everything. There was homeless people walking by, guys in tents who seemed like they've been there for two weeks. There, there was friends pulling up at 4 a.m. with cookout and blankets. There was gamer guys giving us advice on how to get girls. It was just a weird night, all right? It was, it was a really weird night. And then we we're there, we're waiting patiently all night. We, get start, we start to get restless. You know, we've been there for a while. The sun starts to rise, and the manager finally, after all night, rolls into the parking lot. He rolls into the parking lot, he opens the door, and he says, we gotta wait, okay, we're waiting, we've been waiting long enough, we can wait a little longer. He, he, he starts working in, in, in the GameStop, and it takes a super long time. We're getting a little worried, we don't know what's going on, but we don't go to GameStop at 7 a.m. often, so we just don't really question it. And then after a while, he comes out with the news. He tells us that the thing that we've been waiting all night for, the thing that we've been patiently waiting for, had been stolen. You see, the, the, the store next door during Thanksgiving cut a hole in the wall and took all their inventory that they had. And so he told us that they had nothing for us and that we had to leave. Now, fortunately, the story does not end here. My mom was pretty upset by what happened. And so she called up later. She was upset I didn't get a voucher at all or anything. She called up. I got a voucher. I was able to go the next week and, and get the Xbox because I, I endured and suffered through all that pain. And so I, I got a voucher. And so thankfully... I was able to get one. But see, the reason I bring up this story this morning, the reason I tell you this story is because I think you and I act like this a lot of times in our life. We wait. We wait patiently. We go through suffering. We go through hardships. We go through pain for the things we care about the most in our life. The things that we care about, the things that we desire the most, we will wait for. We'll be excited to wait. We'll go through that pain. We, we will wait when we know what the end goal is. I believe today the passage that we are reading, the passage that we just read, shows us that as Christians, we wait, and we wait patiently for the coming of the Lord. We should be excited for the day when Jesus comes back. We should be patiently waiting for when that happens. If you turn to verse 7, James tells us that we should be patient. He says, be patient. He's talking to the one who is following Jesus, talking to the one who is treasure, putting our treasures up in heaven. Be patient, because there will be a day when Jesus comes back and the things of this world will not fully matter and we can rejoice in heaven. We are expectantly waiting for when Jesus comes back. So be patient like the farmer. And so what I want to do this morning is go over three things. Three things that what we are supposed to be doing while we wait. You see, we're kind of stuck in this in-between if we are Christians. We're waiting for the day when Jesus comes back, when we meet Jesus face to face, but we're here on earth now with all the things of this world. So what are we to do while we are waiting? I believe James is outlining those things on what we are supposed to be doing, how we can have this real, authentic faith right here and right now. And so the first thing I think James outlines for us in his text is that we are called to stand firm. To stand firm. You see, the beginning and the end of these letters are actually quite similar. The beginning, if you recall, all the way back to week one of our James series is talking about the trials, the temptations of the world. He says, have joy in them because those trials, those temptations will actually build you up, will endure you, and you will be able to be steadfast. This idea of patient endurance. 
And then if you look to the end of this letter right here, it's this idea of patient endurance again, talking about steadfastness. We can stand firm in our faith. This idea that it may not make sense now, but the Lord has a plan for it all. So stand firm in it all. Through all the suffering, through all the pain, through all the hurt, stand firm. Now listen, I'm not ignorant to know know that uh, I, I grew up with two loving, healthy parents I, I never really had a struggle in my life. I, I have a great opportunity for future. There's no one really has unexpectedly died in my life. God has graciously given me these things that I really don't deserve, and I'm forever thankful for that. But I want you to see my heart this morning. I know as soon as I say things like, hey guys, stand firm in your faith. Keep going. It will all be all right. As long as you just keep going and following Jesus, everything will be Okay. I know as soon as I say that, the temptation is to think, Sean, you're just some 20-year-old kid. You don't get it. Life hasn't hit you yet. You don't have a job to worry about. You don't have to worry about getting fired. You don't have, you don't have kids or a family to worry about. You don't have a mortgage. You don't have, you don't have to worry about anything. You just don't get it. And you're right. I, I really don't get it. It would be impossible, impossible for me to know exactly what everyone is going through in this room. And so that's why I want you to see my heart this morning. When I tell you to stand firm, when I tell you to have the joy in all these trials, temptation, is not because of what I feel. Man, I'm not here this morning telling you what I feel like I, you should do with your life, what, how, what I've done or what I've experienced. That's not what I'm here to tell you. I'm here to point you to God's word, to what God has done, what God has gone through. We believe in a Jesus who was put on the cross for every single thing that you are going through and have gone through. And that is the guy I'm trying to point you to this morning. Man, God knows exactly what you're going through. He knows what pain, what suffering, what hurt. And it could be as simple this morning as stressing over bills, wanting your family to have a good life, knowing you're prideful, knowing you have anxiety, mourning a death, whatever it is, man, God knows what you're going through. And so when I say stand firm in those things, it's because James is here. God is telling us to do that. God is showing us that is actually how we have that real, authentic faith. And God can do a lot with just a little faith. But we have to be able to give it to him. We have to be able to give it to him this morning. God has a plan. And if we believe that he is faithful and just, and he is, then we can trust that he knows what he is doing with the things of this world. Now, he is in control of it all. So stand firm. James also points to the story of Job as an example of the steadfastness. If you think of the story, Job is robbed of everything in his life, his family, his friends, everything that he has, his possessions. Think of the story of Abraham and Sarah. Sarah was barren. She wanted a child but couldn't have it. Think of the story of Elijah who was depressed and suicidal. See, the Bible has every version of life going wrong because it always does. Life always goes wrong. So how can James sit here then and say, Stand firm. It's because he knows, God knows, that real, authentic faith changes everything for us. Real faith changes the way we live. It changes the lives around us. It changes our lives forever. Man, we've been talking about this idea of real faith, real, authentic faith for this whole series. This idea that we can't get caught in this going through the motions. We can't get caught on just only caring a little bit, this half-hearted Christian life. James saying that's not what we are called to do. That's actually worse off. This real authentic faith is everything we have for Jesus. So stand firm. It isn't worth it to just be half-hearted in this life. Stand firm in the trials, temptations of this world and focus our attention on God, knowing that he is in control of it all. Listen, I'm not saying it isn't hard. I'm not saying you won't struggle because you will, and it is hard. But I'm saying we believe in a God this morning. We believe in a God who has gone through it, who knows what's going on, and can get us through anything. And so stand firm because of that truth, not because of anything we're doing, but because we believe in a God who can help us in that. So take heart and stand firm in your faith. This patient endurance is something he's building up in us all. And so as we are preparing, as we are waiting for the day when Jesus comes back, what are we to do now? How do we have this authentic, real faith? I believe we stand firm. But secondly, I think James outlines that we should seek community. Seek 
community. And what I want to do for the next eight to 10 minutes is convince you this morning that godly community is not an option to the Christian life. It is actually something we need, something we have to have. And so I'm going to give you three reasons. The first reason is, is because it unifies us. We are unified in Christ. If you look to James 13 through 15, it says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone among you cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. You see, James here is not, he's not just asking if we are with other people. He's actually already, assume, already assuming that we are with others. He's already assuming that we are with other believers, other Christians around. He's asking, are those people that already are among you, are they sick? Are they hurting? Do they need praise? So James already has this idea that we are already in community. James just assumes that. And so the one thing that we know that has to unite us, the one thing that we know that we, you and I can both share no matter what we are, if we are both Christians, we share in the fact that we, our foundation of life is Jesus. It unifies us, us. Even though we are all different in our own ways, we are unified in Christ. Now, I do, I think there is a caveat here. I think this is important to know that I don't think that just means we should have community with whoever we want. Now, obviously, that would be okay. Like, that would be totally okay. And we are unified in Christ. But I do think it is actually more helpful and even more wise to do it with people in the same stage of life as you're in. For instance, I don't think it would be as helpful for me to be in community with people in their 50s. Now, listen, no hate to the people in their 50s. It's just, we're in different, we're in different stages of life. We're, we're, we're talking about different things. They're, they're talking about kids and grandkids and mortgages and whatnot. And I, I'm over here talking about spike ball, lifting weights, eating cookout at 2 a.m. It's just, it's just different things. The lifestyles usually don't mix. And so my challenge would be find community, find people who are unified in Christ, who are around the same stage of life as you are in. You don't have to be exactly alike, but this idea of true godly community, I believe, is not optional in the Christian faith. Seek community, enjoy it, because we are alike in the fact that we are, united, we are unified in Christ, united in Christ. But secondly, seek community because we actually need it. We need each other. Look at verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Man, we actually need each other. We actually need it. To, to grow in our faith, to grow in our walk with Christ, we need each other. We were men. We, we were created to have relationships. We were created to have friendships. God created us as social human beings. We were not made for isolation. Basil, an early church father, writes, When we live our lives in isolation, what we have is unavailable, and what we lack is unprocurable. He's basically saying is what we need to grow in, we can't have from other people for an is if we're isolated. And what God has gifted us in, we can't help other people grow in because we are isolated. We were not created to be isolated people. We actually need each other. Community with others is for everyone to grow. Something else this verse also brings into account for a community is this idea of accountability and confession. If, if you have not practiced this, this is not uh, an option in the faith either. This is a command that we are giving. He says, confess to one another and pray to one another that you may be healed. I, I know you may even be thinking that it's super easy, right? It's super easy to just go through a Christian walk, confess something, but not fully repent to God. For instance, say you're angry, you gossip a lot, you know you're prideful, and you give it to God, like right? you say, God, forgive me of this, but you don't fully take the steps out to take it out of your life. James is telling us here that community actually brings that into it. So when you bring it to your friends, you bring it to people in godly community, they can ask you the next week, hey, Sean, how has your anger been? How has your pride been? It's a lot harder to get away with doing that when you bring it in to community. We actually need each other. Community is necessary to the faith if we want to take our life with Jesus seriously. Man, the time I saw the most growth in my faith was when I was uh, a freshman at Anderson. I'm a senior now, and it just, I just remember go, going all the way back to freshman year. 
when I first got to Anderson. It wasn't the sermons that I heard. It wasn't the classes I was taking. It, it, it wasn't all those things. Now, obviously, those things helped a lot, but it was finding out what good godly community really looked like with other believers, finding out how to use confession, how to use accountability right, how to actually use all these things that James is telling us to use here. Man, that, that challenged me the most I've ever been challenged in my life. Walking through the Bible together, man, community really is necessary. We need each other. The Christian walk is almost impossible to do without other believers. I mean, think about it. That's why we come to church. That's why we gather together. That's why COVID was so hard. We're not together as one. That's why we need each other. All society, all of culture is trying to tell you, do it on your own. Man, you can handle it yourself. You can, you can do it on your own. You, you, you are your best hype, man. That is what culture is trying to tell us, but the Bible tells us something very different. We need each other. We need God in our lives. We all have different likes. We all have different dislikes. We all have different personalities, but we serve a purpose. We're like the, the Romans 12, 4 and 5 tell us that we are like a body. We're body parts working together. We all serve a purpose. We actually need each other. So see community because it unifies us. We actually need it. But thirdly, see community because we advance the kingdom of God. Read the last two verses of the book. It says, My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Man, in community, we can celebrate the saved, pray for the lost. We can be together in it all. I don't know if we often don't realize that we are actually either getting closer to Christ, we're becoming more like Christ, or becoming more like the world. There's really not an in-between. You're really either doing one or the other. And so the saying of that, that the average of the five closest people to us is kind of who we are really is pretty accurate. The, the people around us, their personalities, their tactics, the things that they do, the things that they act, really do rub off on us. It's the simple theory that, that, the, that the things that people do actually do have an impact on us. We actually are influenced. We are creatures of habit, whether we like it or not. The things that we do, say, think, or do over and over again will be something that we do, say, think, or do naturally. It's just how we were created. And so if your closest friends, your best friends, the people you see almost every day, the people you see often are not people who follow after Jesus, then following after Jesus is almost impossible. I'm not saying it isn't, it isn't possible. I, God definitely can work in your life, but I'm saying it is a lot harder. And we're not setting ourselves up well, and it's not showing what real authentic faith looks like, as James outlines it. The, the, this idea is hard. The lifestyles often don't mix with friends who are Christians and friends who aren't Christian. It, it's kind of like being friends with a South Carolina fan when you're a de- diehard Clemson fan. Or, or maybe even you're friends with a guy who likes cats, but you love dogs. The ideas just don't mix. Now, obviously, those are jokes, but I really do think that is important to know that godly Christian community is what we need in our lives. It's not an option to the Christian faith. And so I think I, I've butchered that point enough, and I hope you see my heart in that, but I really do think that's something we often miss. We think our lives are too busy. We think we're going through our lives. We already have enough to worry about, and just doing that would be too hard. It's not something we need. But I hope you see this morning that seeking community is not something that is just helpful for us. It's actually something we need to grow in our faith. So seek community. And if you're already in community, man, Grow it. Find others that you can have in it. Make sure using this model that James outlines for us of community, uh, of confession, accountability, prayer with one another. Seek community. But lastly, this morning, as we are looking to what we should do while we are waiting in this in between, as Jesus comes back, how do we have this authentic faith right here and right now? You stand firm. You seek community. But thirdly, I want us to see that we should pray faithfully. Pray faithfully. Look at verse 17 and 18. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruits. James gives us this idea of the story of Elijah. The story of Elijah in this verse is and how 
how Elijah prayed fervently, how he prayed faithfully. And I know it can be even a little more overwhelming thinking, man, of course God is going to answer a prayer like Elijah. He raised people from the dead. He, he did these miracles. He saved people. He was this awesome guy. Of course God will answer people like that. But James tells us so very clearly, he says, Elijah was a, was a man with a nature like ours. He was human just like us. He had depression. He was suicidal. He really did have issues just like you and I have issues. The thing that he did was pray. He prayed faithfully. He prayed with a heart full of faith, believing that God would do it. And that's what it looks like to pray faithfully. That was the difference in his life. S.D. Gordon writes in his book, Quiet Talks on Prayer. He says, the great people of the earth today are the people who pray. I do not mean those who talk about prayer, nor those who say they believe in prayer, not even those who can explain about prayer. He says, but I mean those people who actually take time and pray. My question for you this morning is, what is your first response to the things of this world? Do you go out and seek friends and family when any minor inconvenience happens? Do we seek the, the scrolling through TikTok and Facebook and wanting advice from there, seeing that they, they tell us this awful advice? Do we seek that? Or do we just ignore it altogether? What is your first response to the things of this world when suffering, when pain, when all these things come your way? James so clearly shows us here, he outlines that our response to everything should be prayer. He says, pray for anything and everything. It's what brings us to God and puts him at the center of it all, the center of our whole life. If God will answer the prayer of an ordinary man like Elijah, of course he's going to answer a prayer to people like us. God answers those prayers. He will and he does. So pray with faith, expecting God to do it. Pray with a heart of faith. Now listen, I want you to hear me this morning. This does not mean praying a heart full of selfish ambition. Full, pray, don't pray with a heart that only wants yourself to gain. Man, prayer is more than just a grocery list. And what I mean by that is that prayer is inviting God into our lives, inviting God into our hardships, our relationships, our friendships, our hurting, our pain, our suffering, our plan. Prayer is not reading off your wants and desires off a grocery list saying, God, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this. All right, that's good for tonight. Amen. And that's not prayer. That's a genie in a bottle. Just granting all your wishes. That is not what God wants for us. Prayer is seeking God, putting him at the center of our lives so that we can actually have the godly perspective that we need to go through the things, to go through the suffering, to go through our plan. That is why we pray, to put God at the center of our lives, of all those things. Obviously, our responses are okay if those, all those things, as long as God comes first. God has to be the first thing we go to. God has to be the one we seek. So pray, but make sure it's a heart full of faith, not of selfish gain. So as James ends this letter, he shows us what we need to do in our walk with Christ. As we're waiting for Jesus, what we need to do we stand firm through all the hardships and the hurting of life. We seek community because those are the people that are going through it too. And you should also be praying faithfully. That is the real authentic faith James has been trying to show us this whole series. And so as we are closing, I want to make it super easy for you. I want to make it super easy for you in how to respond to this text. To the Christian in the room, I want you to think of the three points we have this morning, the three things that James outlines for us. Standing firm, seeking community, and praying faithfully. I would challenge you to think of what you need to work on the most in your life. Personally, for me right now, it's praying faithfully. What is it for you this morning? Do you need to remind yourself that you need to stand firm of the things of this world? You've been turning too much to the things of this world, and you need to remind yourself that you need to stand firm through it all because Jesus has done it. God has done it in your life. He's changed your life forever. Or do you realize that you need to see community for the first time? Maybe you've done it for a little while, but you haven't really taken it seriously and you, you want to actually start taking it serious. Or maybe you just need to remind yourself that, that we, just need to, we just need to pray in everything and for everything because God can change the outcome. God can change our perspective on anything. 
that we ask. What is it for you this morning? Secondly, I would say if you don't really know where you're at in your faith, you don't really know where you stand. We've been talking about these things. We, we've been talking about, you don't really know maybe how it even looks like to take the next step. Man, I would just challenge you this morning to respond to the text. Maybe you haven't decided to follow Jesus. Maybe you just need to know what the next step looks like. Or maybe you just need to be prayed for. I'll, I'll be up here. I'd love to have a conversation with you and pray for you. Uh, Pastor Ashley's here. He'd love to do that as well. He's much wiser than I am. There, there's, a, there's a team in the back that, we, that, that would pray for, over for you if, if you want. There are ways to respond to the text that we read this morning. There are ways to respond to God. Don't leave this morning without responding to the text. Let's pray. God, you are amazing. Lord, we're, we are so thankful for what you've done in our lives. So thankful for who you are. So thankful for all the people in this room coming together. God, I'm just praying for everyone in here right now. As we're just reminded from your text, reminded from your words, God, that we should stand firm in the faith because of what you have done. We should see community and live out the life that we are called to live with other believers. We should pray faithfully, putting you at the center of it all. God, work in the hearts of everyone here right now. Lord, I'm just praying for the Christian in the room. I'm also praying for the one who doesn't know where they stand. God, I'm praying that you would just challenge their heart, move in their life as they're working towards you. God, you are faithful, and we can put our full trust, we can put the control of our lives in your hands. So let me pray. Amen.